I'm going to be joined by a guy that, uh, in, not only did I learn a lot from our panelists just now, a guy that I've learned a lot from over a decent period of time. I've swapped books back and forth with Ed Hyman. Uh, he's just been a, a great mentor to me, a friend of the Sloan School, a loyal alum, and one of my favorite people. How you doing, sir? Good to see, nice you, see sir. you, Thanks for coming. Yeah. I've gone on to have this um, just unbelievable career. Uh, Ed has been ranked for, was it 35 or 36 years in a row? 85. 80, not 85 <laughs> years. Ed, Ed was ranked for like 35-ish years in a row by institutional investor as the best economist on Wall Street. Either you've got really good friends at institutional <laughs> investor. Right. Uh, and, you know, like we all know, there was some competition for that top spot. Um, my, Ed, Ed, my first question for you is, do you actually have a crystal ball? No, but uh, I outwork them, and I went to the Sloan School. <laughs> and, uh, and wow. Actually, a lot of what I learned there has carried me forward. For example? Uh, so I, I started doing econometrics. Uh, unlike some of you, it was a home run for me. So I started doing econometrics at MIT, and then I went to work for uh, Data Resources, which was doing exactly what I was doing at MIT commercially. Okay. And then I went to work for one of their clients. And what are the main things that your clients need your help with? Is it seeing into the future with greater it's, clarity? It's, uh, it's, yes, trying to figure out what the, in my case, you know, all the people on Wall Street have different positions, whether yeah. you're an industrial analyst or a political analyst or doing what I do, trying to understand the economy. And so I'm trying to help them figure out what's going on now and what might be the most likely path for the next few weeks, few months, and into few years. And you have to put that into context. Is your toolkit, either your mental toolkit or your technical toolkit, different? for those different time frames that you just identified? Uh, I think that uh, I'm very bottom up. Uh, I work with uh, 30 analysts in uh, retail and industrial and financial, and I meet with clients constantly, all the time. Yep. And I'm listening and listening and listening. Uh, and then I go back and I look at the data and research uh, the data. But we've, we've also developed a, uh, program where we survey uh, 350 companies a week. The same, same companies. Same companies. The same person oh. with the same question. Uh, how is your business this week compared to what you expected? So we do truckers, retailers, home builders, banks, restaurants, uh, 11 categories in that space. And then we also do 28 companies that do business uh, in Europe and 21 companies that do business in China. So I can give you a perfect analysis of, of what is happening in those three areas. The only drawback is that the surveys have absolutely no predictive power. Right now, our surveys indicate for the U.S. that the economy is growing 3.5%, okay. which is about a point faster than most other people think. And, about a half a point faster than anybody thinks. Huh. And, but I, that's, uh, so we, we do a survey of home builders. Yeah. Rates have just backed up about 100 basis points, the mortgage rate. So, you know, you, you wouldn't know whether or not that's going to hurt housing or help housing because there are a lot of people that are fence sitters. Most every place I go to is booming, is another way to say uh, the same, same thing. Okay, so housing is, has got a real buzz. Uh, whether it's you know Charlotte or Dallas or Denver or Seattle or, or Boston for that matter. But this is this is weird to me because when you and I were were getting ready for this panel yesterday, you told me that in a lot of your client meetings and you go around and talk to right. clients all the time. Right. You told me that I think a majority of your clients right now are bearish. Right. So half half the people I talk to are bearish. Uh, How do I square that with with this happy story you just told? Because they're looking at the, st I'm thinking bearish about the econ about the stock market, and so the the issues is that the, uh, the economy has been expanding for a decade, yeah, and there's a certain uh, body feeling you get that you know a decade's enough. You don't, that's enough, 
and then uh, the market is uh, not cheap. It was expensive, now it's not cheap. And the Fed's tightening, and it's now tightening with the new operation uh, quantitative tightening, yep. which we've never done before. Uh, and then there are a lot of uh, geopolitical uncertainties, you know, maybe starting with the White House or uh, I'm not trying to <laughs> cut it out. <laughs> you know, Syria, uh, Middle East, uh, there's a lot of uncertainty. And so a lot of my friends uh, think it's just too much uncertainty to be fully invested. And so they're kind of retreating they're, a little bit. Yeah, right. uh, does this period in time that we're in right now remind you of anything else that you've seen in your career or that you've read about? Because I know what a voracious yeah. reader you are. So um, the first answer is not even close. <laughs> you, know, you have to be really poetic to see anything like this. Uh, and, and it really is, it's really something. Like, but help us understand what makes this period so, so, so unique. Uh, well, you've had quantitative easing, you have interest rates uh, very low, you have unemployment rate at 4% and the wages aren't picking up. You've been at it for a decade. Uh, Got it. And, and when I, I don't remember any time in my career when every place I go to is booming. So, so this constellation of economic factors is not something that we've seen a lot before. So, so then you say, well, couldn't you be a little more creative than that? And uh, I've studied the last three true economic juggernauts, the Roaring Twenties, Japan, which I, I was all high, in high school then, but I still remember something about it. Sure. And uh, then Japan in the 90s, which I lived through pretty intensely. Yep. And then, of course, everybody knows the tech boom in the 90s. And all three of those <laughs> but Wait, those are not happy patterns. Well, this is not going to have a happy pattern either. <laughs> but <laughs> Is, is everybody getting out their phones and putting sell orders in on everything right now? No, but it, so in, in each of those cases, in the last five years, the market tripled. In the, in the five years prior to the, the end. bad event? Yeah. And are, you think we're going to watch this movie again? Yes, I'm, I've already paid and got my ticket. <laughs> it's a nice theater here. We can watch it here. Uh, but uh, so in, in each of those places, each of those episodes, you had low inflation. And then this gets right into why I'm here and interested in what you're thinking, because they all had technology booms. And I'd normally be kind of happy to hear you say that, but when you point to those previous episodes in history, I start to panic a little bit. Well, you, know, you need to panic in about three or four years, sir. <laughs> but uh, but te technology is a big part of the, of the episode. I have a single equation econometric model that I use, and it use, has rates in it and price of oil, yeah. uh, mortgage rates, consumer net worth, BAA spreads. It is forecasting 3% growth okay. for the next couple of quarters. Then these company surveys I mentioned, yep. uh, they are higher than they were in 2014 when growth was almost four, okay. and they're back to where they were in 2014 four and five, when growth was four and a half. So right now, when I talk to companies. When you talk to companies, yep. Uh, they tell me that the economy is, is doing quite well. Second, they report uh, every week consumer confidence. That's at a 17-year high. One seven. One seven. So now you're telling me that they don't cover the towns you're thinking about. <laughs> but hopefully, they're scientifically done or this conference board, University of Michigan, uh, Bloomberg's measure of confidence, confidence, they're all elevated, 17 year high. You would have a hard time explaining to somebody why confidence in this country right now should be at a 17 year high. But uh, maybe it's interesting uh, for all of us because I've studied why these local economies are doing well. And it's not your standard you know, housing or autos or capital spending. Uh, so the first vector is higher education. Good. University towns are doing great. It, great. Okay. And it doesn't have to be MIT. It can be like Emory is really, which is a great school also, but they have a big biotech company, uh, biotech uh, industry coming out of that, like Boston does out of the schools there. 
So higher education. Second one in the same zip code is healthcare. Okay. And that's, you know, for almost every city, that's a, a prime, you know, Mass General uh, Cleveland Clinic. And then the middle vector is new tech, yep. not Cisco, and frankly, not maybe even Microsoft. Uh, but uh, new tech is everywhere. I guess you probably know better than I do, but uh, say Salt Lake City's booming. They have Draper, uh, which is a little town, uh, which is a big tech boom. Uh, Denver has a, all, more startups, and I was just in, Sil they call it uh, Silicon Slopes. <laughs> I was just in. Selling the lifestyle, right? <laughs> and I was just in LA, and they call it uh, Silicon Beach. Uh, and then the in Boston we call it silicon freezing rain, <laughs> right? <laughs> Which might not be great marketing. And so then the uh, so any of the other, the last vector is entertainment, huh. which 40 years ago, you wouldn't think of as being a big deal. I know how much you read it, and, and when you, I know you've read the books that that Eric and I have written. Yeah, absolutely fabulous. As you read them, did you find yourself saying? you know, give me a break. I, I've heard a lot of technology hype all throughout my career. No. Or, no. This is different. It's Did, just well, a, it, I doubt I, that we convinced you of that. So what convinced well, you of that? Well, it's a combination of, you know, being a student, of looking around at life. Yep. And, um, you know, you, uh, you can't go anywhere. Everybody has a cell phone. You go to Africa, everybody has a cell phone. And, you know, that's having commerce, you know, work much better. Uh, I used to work... Uh, 10 hours on Sunday, uh, every Sunday, and now I work half an hour. I get the same job done. Really? Yeah. You're as productive with one twentieth half of the yeah. time. Yeah, and it's because of tech, tech, technology, and that's so true. You would see it everywhere. You know, whether it's, you know, get, get, getting through customs, you know, with the yeah. uh, uh, trucks, uh, cars, uh, if they get that on driverless. Uh, so uh, that gets us to another point, because uh, I listened to what you're saying and technology in general. So I mentioned to you that I think growth is going to be three and a half percent. Okay. They reported this morning that growth was three. So I'm not totally crazy. Okay. Got it. If growth was three and a half, uh, it's likely that employment will not increase much more than one and a half, or maybe one, one and a half because there aren't enough people out there. We're, the, you know, the labor force is we're, not we're gonna, growing. We're gonna bump up against the available labor force. We already are. But what about the fact that there are a lot of prime age people not being counted in that unemployment statistic because they're just on the sidelines of the economy? Whew, well, let me come to that in a second. Okay. So uh, if growth is 3.5%, which not few think, but let's say it was, even three would get the job done, and uh, Employment increases one and a half. Yep. Productivity will be two. And that's, we haven't had two since like 04. Yeah, we'd love, we long for two, right? You know, so, you know, people like Larry Summers would go, gosh, I've been so concerned about the economy, secular stagnation, yeah. because we didn't have productivity. If we get productivity, then, and inflation still hasn't picked up, there could be a mine shift. So, this morning, for the first time, I tried it out, knowing I was coming here, my new mantra, which is the great expansion. So we had the great recession. Yep. And now, we won't know for four years or five years, but we're having a great expansion. But I think we're having, we could have a great expansion because we, now we have productivity and inflation is low and technology is making a huge difference. You're a productivity bull going forward? Productivity is gonna be much better than people think. So for example, Eric and I keep saying that too, and, and each quarter we keep being proven wrong. When are we gonna be right finally? Well, I've been proven wrong so many quarters, it doesn't even phase me, but. Uh... <laughs> Ed, I wanna ask you one final question, and then let's throw it up and, and again, see what we all wanna talk about. Uh, if you came across a really smart young person coming out of a great school like Sloan these days, and wanted advice about how to be the premier Wall Street economist for the next 35 years, what would you tell them? Go into advertising. <laughs> no, how many I, of us were expecting I would, that? I, would, I, wouldn't, <laughs> I wouldn't even begin to do that. But as, as everybody knows, 
uh, a lot of it's luck. You know, finding something. Mine was luck. You find not, something. It's not, Ed, come on. 35 years in a row is not luck. No, but I had to get in the right position okay. to be lucky. Uh, I run across people, you, you do too, all the time. They say, God, that guy is immensely talented, but just going nowhere. And part of it's luck. But so land in the right spot early land in Land the right career. spot. And, and then do what? You have to find something that you really are willing to you know, work you know, 24-7, 12 months a year. And, and, and are, were you willing to do that because you're in general a workaholic or because you're so passionately interested in this phenomenon? I think it's a combination. I think people that, first, I'm really good at working. I'm just... <laughs> <laughs> One of my few skills, I can just, just really, just, just I can work. just sit and, and work for hours. But you wake up excited about what you're going to go do throughout the day. I, I wake up excited right now because how can you not be? I mean, what's going on right now is just beyond imagination. Because, every, you know, whether it's technology yeah. or the interest rates aren't going up. I mean, this thing on Kim today, the North Korea, uh, South Korea, I mean... People are saying this is like a mini Berlin Wall. Yeah. Uh, you have to get excited about that. Uh, and so it's, it, these are exciting times uh, in my space. Got it. Actually, in your space, too. Well, I mean, it, we, we think so, right? Yeah. <laughs> well, I've got a sort of a double-barreled question. One is about measurement, and the other is about time frames. Um, regarding the measurement... Time frame? Time frame, yeah. So regarding the measurement part, you were talking about productivity and also about GDP. And I was wondering how, um, how accurately do digital or online goods or participation um, count in those measures? For instance, you talked about productivity in this room. You saw a number of empty seats. Would a measure of that productivity count for the people who might view this conference online, who would then also be working? Um, obviously, that wouldn't apply to the number of bodies on a flight, um, transcontinental flight. But if you calculate productivity by physical bodies somewhere or um, also online participation, similarly with GDP, it's like, are the measures of the digital economy of online goods and services calculated okay. accurately in that? Okay, well, obviously, the answer is that it's difficult. Uh, so I added up the revenue of the big four that reported yesterday, yep. Facebook, Google, Amazon, Netflix. Uh, if you add up the revenue, they accounted for 10% of GDP growth. Those, four, those companies. four companies. Those four companies. 10%. $400 billion up 40%. I also mentioned the, the things that are driving local economies. They're hard to measure. Uh, and so it's difficult to measure GDP. Uh, this week, they revised new house sales up 8%. They, re they took and said, it, we thought it was this. Actually, it's 8% more. So there are a lot of things that are very, I'm not complaining about them. I'm just saying it's difficult to measure. Is it more difficult than it was 5, no. 10, 20? It's easier because of technology. You have all the data. But it's still, because of the way the economy is changing, there are parts of the economy that are difficult. Healthcare, I mentioned, I mean, that's enormously difficult to measure. And the rumbling that you hear is, are the stomachs of the people in this audience because we're <laughs> keeping them from lunch. I want, I want to wrap up by saying thank you for my, giving us. My, my pleasure. <laughs>